uh, common uh, taxa or spaces located uh, over there and to sustain the homeostasis of our lung. But for uh, certain disease, uh, the conversation or consistency of, uh, of the microbiome will change a lot. And here are some disease and their related um, uh, harmful uh, microbiomes. Uh, and for this project, we specifically focus on the uh, asthma model. And uh, so because this work is uh, like a continuing work uh, from a different group, and before that, they already fit certain models. So I will present uh, the new models I used for the variational, uh, variation uh, stabilization transformation. Uh, to update their model. So that's basically the main purpose. So uh, a brief introduction about uh, my data set. And as I said before, we used the, the monozygous um, twin pairs. And the, because they have a lot of advantages uh, for our study. And the, as we know, um, the microbiome in our lung uh, would affected by uh, the persons, like um, uh, their housing, their behavior, their physical or their genetic information. And uh, if we use the monozygous twin pairs, and if we can take advantage of this by eliminate most of the, um, the confiners. And as we can see that this coordinate um, twin pairs remains just like uh, for a pair of twins, there's like one, uh, one twin behaves just like with normal situation and the other one with the disease. And in this way, we can specifically see just like uh, which specific kind of microbiome uh, spaces uh, affect uh, the disease model. And uh, here is my table one. And uh, uh, for this model, we specifically um, focus on the age and the genotype and the, uh, the, the phenotype. So here is the model. And uh, as I said before, this is, uh, there's some early work based on the data set. And the first one is uh, an active binomial model, I should label here, uh, they used before. And uh, I'm not quite sure uh, whether there is specifically evidence based on this research, but they uh, removed um, the effects of age and the asthmatic um, genotype, uh, uh, phenotype uh, in this one. And uh, to confirm what they get from their result, I also uh, effect in the age and asthma into back to the negative binomial model. And because it's related to a lot of spaces and microbiome, so uh, we don't want to specifically set up certain uh, my, uh, the, the spaces as intercept or reference group. So uh, I will still remove the intercept. And uh, compared with that, I updated the model with a variation a stabilization transformation. I think it's more similar to our uh, linearization method uh, in the generalize the linear mixed model. But for the Bayesian uh, tool I used is RSTAN. Uh, it could not run the, uh, the linearization function, the GLMM, uh, uh, PQ, the, the, the package. Uh, it could not compact with the RSTAN. So I have to do the transformation to linearize my data first and then fit the model with the Gaussian. And uh, uh, also we included a correlation uh, covariance uh, with the Pearson correlation to adjust the, for the different spaces. And let's see um, here. And uh, for this one, uh, here is the something for the sequencing data. And because for different spaces in different individual, uh, the counting for each spaces will change a lot. And the most time we use the, uh, the spaces with higher uh, observational uh, counting because the lower of the counts, um, 
the higher of the bias and the variance would be introduced into the model. So in this one, I was specifically uh, selected the top nine spaces with the highest um, uh, countings. And here's the, the bar plot. And here is the correlation uh, I mentioned before uh, with the Pearson correlation uh, showed up in the heat map. Because for certain spaces, um, they would like a color plus together where one of the spaces would affect the other spaces uh, existence. So I think it would be reasonable to adjust the, uh, my data set based on the correlation for different spaces. Uh, and another thing I want to mention is um, for the sequencing analysis, there are a lot of methods. And for this one, I use the relative abundance, which means uh, we'll look at the, the percentage of certain spaces and how much they take up the entire total counting. And there are also other things like um, alpha diversity or beta diversity uh, could be used to uh, look at um, how the how each species would affect the others um, uh, counting and uh, uh, just diversity, but it's not uh, fully uh, explored in this project. And first, the thing I did is I just ran a normal. Um, it's not normal. It's the uh, generalized the linear mix model with Poisson. And uh, I run like a 20, 23 of them. And here are the top ones with AIC. Um, I know it's not the best way to do the model selection, but, um, and the good thing is the good ones, the top ones, they didn't work. Uh, most time there will be uh, error to show uh, reach to the singularity, we just like, in other words, we just like overfitted the model and sometimes they just could not um, converge. And so, um, so we just move on into the Bayesian model. And here's the code for um, the earlier part of the research. I want to fit the, uh, the zero inflate Poisson model. And that's also a part of the earlier work uh, but sadly, this part didn't work, and it took a really long time to run this. Uh, I think I ran this one for three times, but after five hours, and it just showed me for the first chain, it didn't converge. Um, so um, uh, for certain things I want to mention about this um, function is the BRM, and it's the um, Main function uh, for the uh, for the library, the package, and is the Bayesian regression model used for STEM. And later I will show you the, some advantages of the STEM package. And the, in fact, we can fit uh, almost all the GLM and the LM uh, functions from uh, R. And also, uh, as we can see here, uh, we add uh, the covariance structure uh, with the, the Pearson correlation. And for the um, uh, prior, uh, I just uh, set it with the uninformational uh, prior. Uh, but for the early research, they used the, a normal distribution and I didn't find any uh, evidence to support that. Uh, so I just did change that part. So for the first uh, model, I think it's just like recheck their old ones. And uh, uh, for this one, it removed the age and the, the, the phenotype of the kids. And uh, we got like uh, three uh, significant coefficients. Uh, and uh, here are the trees plot for those, uh, for those uh, covariant and the uh, and the, the, there's no intercept. And the, as we see here, and the, the trace plot shows pretty consistent um, for each one. And <clears throat> you can see more details after I uh, upload this slice. Is that, and sorry, Randy, is that using a MCMC right there? Yes. Okay. Yes, I used the, uh, for, for this one, I used this free chain and three chains and the uh, 10,000 uh, 
iteration and for the first uh, 2500 I uh, use them as the warm up. Okay. And the end of the step is like a 10 or 20. I think it's 10. And here is some uh, diagnostics uh, after I run the model. And as we can see, uh, here is the um, mean and the standard deviations uh, ratio plot. And uh, here is our model given value. Uh, and the, the others are the uh, iterations from the, from the simulation. And uh, also I want to mention this one, uh, the PSIS diagnostic plot. And for this one is used a, a, spe uh, a specific method called the pyruto shape, okay? And uh, because we know um, the air basin method is based on the uh, simulation or permutation. Um, so it cannot, um, compared with the AIC model, uh, simil in the similar idea, but they could use other ways to do that. Uh, one of them is use the WAIC. Um, but for this work, it didn't uh, let me to use that one or just give me a warning. Uh, the WAIC is not quite uh, the best way to use it. I think it's more like, um, it's like a point-wise comparison with our real model. And for the PSS diagnostic is based on a similar idea, but it's a little bit different. So, um, so how we look at it is more like, uh, so here we get the parameter of the shape K and the, the lower of the value, uh, as we can see here, the lower of the value, the better is fit for a real data set. And so the more, uh, values show that in the upper bound, like uh, over 0.7, where one, it means um, it didn't fit that well. So it's bad. And uh, uh, based on this, and we can see uh, this model is not uh, the best uh, for the early work. And the, another way to look at it is to use the uh, loose, uh, uh, it's called the loop and the it means leave one out. It has the similar idea of our jackknife. So it will remove one of the, um, your uh, simulation and then compare it with the general one. And uh, uh, I will talk about this part later. And also we can look at uh, the comparison of our real data with the simulated data. And uh, based on this plot, uh, the, it's called the, the posterior, uh, Check the PP check, and it looks like um, we get some um, over dispersion with certain um, phenomenon here. But I, my knowledge is not uh, enough to explain this part yet. So very similar, and we fit the, the new model, which adjusted for the phenotype and the age, and we we can see there's like. Uh, more spaces showed significant uh, for their uh, uh, ex uh, expression over there. And uh, similarly, uh, here are the trees plot to show uh, the covariance converge. And the, in fact, the entire plot looks pretty similar to the old model without an adjustment. And here we see a little bit fewer bad behaviors. And the, the, the PP check plot looks pretty similar to each other. And then I ran uh, the test to check uh, how different those two models looks like. And so uh, I used a function called the ELPD and uh, sorry, I just could not remember exactly what that uh, represent, but I have like a, a glossary at the uh, at the end, and so basically we see that for we'll compare with this two, um, the the difference between those two models uh, based on the criteria, 
uh, and the, the standard error between those two are just like pretty similar with each other. And the, um, that means there's no significant difference between those two models uh, of whether we adjust them or not. Um, this effect is not significant. Uh, I would think uh, if we switch into a hurdle or like a zero inflation model, this could improve a lot because as I said before, um, the counting sequence for each species varies a lot for a lot of them, there will be a bunch of zeros. And I'm not quite sure in this case, a uh, general Poisson or negative binomial model would be best for uh, this data set. And after that, I did the, um, similar to our linearization um, methods, it's called variational stabilization transformation. And uh, I think uh, the basic idea is like uh, the, the, the computer would use delta method or other way to transform the counting data set into uh, a normal uh, a Gaussian distribution. And uh, here is what we get after the transformation. And uh, um, so we can look at the, after the transformation for each uh, species, each individual, uh, how they are mean and the standard uh, deviation related. I think most time we will select this something like from this area, just like with relatively high uh, mean value and the lower standard deviation. But for uh, this method, I want to compare exactly the same spaces uh, with the old model. So we just select the, the old spaces. And for some of them, as we see after the transformation, it's pretty normal. But for the others, we can see here is some um, heterogeneity kind of things happen. It seems like for certain individual, uh, they get the peak uh, on one side, but for the other, there's another peak. So I think that might cause a problem for this um, transformation. And after uh, we fit in this model and we see there's like a lot more uh, spaces can significantly affect uh, the model, uh, the counting, the outcome, and uh, almost uh, all of them have the significant effect, and uh, like uh, four of them also have uh, interaction with age. That means uh, for each species, they just like all gas uh, more or worse with the age, with the aging process. And here is the trees plot, very similar. And uh, the difference is here, the posterior um, value we can see is like more goes toward a normal distribution um, because of the transformation. And we see a much better uh, the Pyruto shape uh, plot. And only two of them just like really bad and most of them perform really good. Um, but for this one, I use the, the, the package function for the uh, posterior check. And it, this one does not very consistent with what shows here and here. Oh, and uh, I think the, the thing is like, oh, this thing, uh, I did it twice because at first uh, I assume just like, after the transformation, uh, the covariance structure would be similar. So I just directly use it for the first one, is this one. And then I realized that probably that would be the problem. So I did the, the Pearson correlation uh, after the transformation. And it seems like the entire, um, entire model didn't change that much um, relative to what uh, Read, uh, the covariance structure we use. Um, so um, here is the here is the uh, diagnostic uh, I use. I didn't use the the package. I just like plotted with myself, and the, I always think this one is more consistent with the the Pyruto K shape plot, 
because as we can see here is like the after transformation uh, our uh, our simulated data would be just like more close to our real data shape uh, in in the transformation model but for those two is not highly covered uh, at this point I don't have a very specific uh, conclusion I could share so um, I'm open with any um, explanation where results you think would be reasonable and here are some limitations um, for this part and I haven't got uh, enough time to think through that as I said before uh, we can either use the uh, the relative uh, abundance, which is also a lock, uh, a ratio, where we can use directly the the total uh, red, uh, uh, absolute abundance of the sequencing data, and there will be a lot of diversity problem related to this part. And also for the model selection, uh, because they already have earlier work over there, and I run the Poisson. So I just select the, the model looks pretty consistent with the Poisson and their old model. Uh, I'm wondering whether there is a better way to do uh, a model selection in Bayesian background, whether we can still use the, the stepwise model selection with some other methods. And also for this one, I use the non-informative uh, prior so I think that might cause the problem for the zero inflated model. So I think whether if we uh, try a different prior, uh, it will get a better result. Um, and also uh, we can see if after the transformation, there's a lot of, uh, there were like at least like two peak of the distribution and the weather is necessary to use the heterogeneity models we try different transformations um, uh, here are the two um, two possible uh, prior uh, generally get used is called jeffrey's prior and it's also non-informative and uh, um, i think there are just like so much things i need to learn about basing to go further and here's some uh, uh here is the like a really nice book and i learned a lot from uh, this book and uh, here's some um, terminologies and i think i'm done okay thanks randy any quick questions we're running a little bit behind so we can't oh, take sorry. Too much more time but any any quick questions for randy Um, the variance stabilizing transformation, um, that was interesting. The one that I know the, the best is the log transformation, right? That, that's like if the variance tends to increase with the mean, a lot of times just using a log transformation, that will stabilize the variance. Now what, you're, what you did, it looks a little more complicated than that. Um, but uh, I'll, I'd be curious to, to read more about what you yeah. did there. Yeah, because a lot of them has really low abundance. Basically, like I would say like 90% of them are just mm -hmm. zero. Yeah. Yeah, and the diagnostics too, that, that's good that you, you know, delved into that. We, we haven't spent a lot of time on diagnostics in this course, but I may make a few notes about that on, on Wednesday. Um, you know, certainly you guys have seen things I'm sure in your in other courses and especially 66, 11 and 12. Um, but diagnostics are are important. And um, so I, I probably will make a few comments about that on Wednesday. Um, let's go ahead and move on to uh, um, Sway and Xu. Go ahead and uh, start your presentation. Thanks. Sure. Is the slides are visible? Yep. Uh, so, when the world is dealing with uncommunicable uh, data uh, diseases, I thought to start with uncommunicable data like diabetes. So, this project is basically an extend, extensive model analysis and moreover a comparison. So, first I did the data exploration 
and then correlation analysis and feature selection using logistic relation, then outlier detection and basic parameter tuning. So the, the data set is basically uh, uh, Indian diabetes data set from National Institute of Diabetes. So uh, it's, it's morely based on Arizona state and the samples are consist of eight uh, attributes and one of them are having the possible outcomes. So different uh, attributes are like uh, whether the person is, how many times the person is having uh, uh, you know, pregnant or something or the glucose level, blood pressure, skin thickness, insulin, age, uh, BMI, and the outcome will be whether the person is having diabetes or not. So the features, uh, what I, uh, I looked into is uh, glucose primarily and then the blood pressure, uh, whether the BP is greater than 90 or the less than, less than 60 based on the high BP and the low, low BP uh, consideration. And then skin thickness. So it's basically used the estimated fat, uh, which is uh, well, kind of behind the skin. I'm not sure about exactly what they meant, but uh, this is what and the insulin uh, is like the normal insulin level is uh, 16 to 166. So that uh, that I will consider. And for the BMI, that's the body mass uh, index. It's basically between 25 to th uh, 30. So initially I plotted a, a histograms uh, for, for pregnancies, age, glucose and BMI. And uh, as I can see uh, the age and the numbers of times the uh, person is pregnant or not, these are not in normal distribution. But uh, if you see, I mean, it should be uh, normally distributed, but I don't know why it's not. Uh, but the glucose label and the BMI are in normal distribution. So to understand what's the impact of glucose on diabetes, I did some um, conditions. It's like individuals are independent of each other or the distributions are skewed, but the sample is definitely greater than 30. That's one thing. So using a T uh, test, I can see that uh, we can see that you know uh, critical values, which is uh, uh, p value, which is less than 0 0.05. So we uh, reject the null hypothesis uh, over the alternative ones. So I can say that 95% we are confident that the average glucose levels uh, for individuals with diabetes is definitely greater than the people who are not having diabetes. Uh, so this is the BMI distribution. Uh, it's fairly, I can say, distributed, so no need to change on that. I feel like that. And uh, this is the outcome, which, which is like 50-50 percent. I mean, um, we can do the 50-50 split to find, you know, diabetic or non-diabetic. So I didn't find any uh, problem in this age distribution or BMI, but age is having a lot of uh, outlier. So uh, here I plotted a correlation plot. Uh, so I selected only uh, uh, the, uh, the columns which are having uh, greater than 50% of correlation. Uh, this data set is having a uh, multi uh, but there is very less attributes. So I, I considered these factors like skin thickness or insulin or uh, glucose, which are like a uh, higher impact. So the plot two, uh, if we are seeing, then uh, the distribution is uh, slightly uh, shifted towards the left side. So that means uh, the, whoever is having glucose level, that means that that, that is a primary uh, purpose, uh, primary reason of having diabetes. That's what I concluded. And this is a graphical clustering. Now, I thought uh, to plot based on the graphs and without doing any other clustering methods because I tried hierarchical method, but, but it didn't uh, look good. Uh, so here I have uh, clustered based on uh, high BMI and low BMI and the types of diabetes and based on the age factors. So whichever uh, are having you know less than uh, 30 years, they are having lesser diabetes compared to who are having greater than. Basically, it's uh, varying between uh, 20 to 40 years, so it's kind of messed up here. Uh, then for the outlier detection, um, I have used PCA for this reason, and if you're seeing uh, 454 or here 146, 580, these are the uh, five number, basically row numbers which I, uh, these are the outliers in our data, uh, but I did uh, make any changes be, uh, of it because it's obvious that every person will have different kind of uh, blood pressure or thick, uh, skin thickness or even glucose level. So I thought to keep it 
uh, instead of uh, doing any uh, uh, any kind of imputation in this. Then I uh, for the feature selection for our machine learning models, I use logistic regression for the first time. And as you can see, I selected uh, mostly all the all the features. Uh, but when I saw the importance, only glucose, BMI, and age are having you know higher um, a higher importance towards the data. So first, I will use all the fact, all the features, and then I will use the particular uh, feature. Uh, so this is my first GLM model. So uh, for the baseline, I just uh, divided uh, the rows of the diabetes with respect to the total number. So baseline model is giving 65% model accuracy, which is not great, but we cannot accept less than that. So this is just for, uh, for my understanding that what I need to do next for my data. So initially I took all the features and uh, uh, this is pretty good because uh, specificity is like 59% and, uh, and I got 78% accuracy while training and while testing it was like 89%. So I was pretty happy that, uh, I mean, without any feature engineering or anything, it's already giving a really good accuracy. Uh, so this is the ROC curve. I have nothing to say about it because it's pretty good. Uh, then I tried a simple neural network. I split the data into 90, 90% uh, and 10% based on training and test. So while splitting, uh, as as general, it's so having three layers: uh, input, hidden, and output output layers. As we have eight attributes, so I have chosen eight neurons in my hidden layer. And it's relatively small compared to, uh, I mean, I thought to add more hidden layers, but I think the data, data samples are less, so I, don't, I didn't want it to overfit the model. So uh, this, uh, this neural network is a fit forward network. I didn't, um, I, I thought I first used fit forward and then I thought to use back propagation because the weight should go backward so that it should have a proper uh, gradient calculation so that it will be easy to recursively find the weight. So as you can see, 78% uh, is the accuracy, which is not that great compared to logistic. And then I, uh, I moved to find the, a different kind of missing value analysis, which is really a lot because insulin is literally having 374 which is like almost everything is zero. So, but scientifically, uh, a person should not have a zero insulin or skin thickness. It cannot be. So, I kind of imputed the uh, zeros, and these are the QQ plots with zeros. And after removing the zeros, I think after removing, it's pretty normal, and uh, I found it good. But let's see. Um, we'll see if uh, it has some impact on the prediction. So then the logistic regression with missing values, I analyzed using all the parameters and then I selected only BMI and uh, age, glucose and blood pressure with some interaction. But when I saw the uh, this ROC plots, uh, uh, logistic regression with zeros or after ex excluding the zeros, I didn't find much change because it's almost similar. And interaction terms, I think it was not at all working because maybe what happened but i didn't see any changes due to uh, you know adding interaction so i kind of didn't uh, consider this factor so in uh, logistic regression with zeros uh, it's having um, uh, 76% accuracy which is not that great again because the first time we got 89% uh, then i tried a simple nav base uh, this is uh, definitely giving 77% without any changes, so I kind of liked it. Uh, then I tried uh, decision tree uh, using complexity parameter as my hypertune. So initially when I plotted the um, graph, I kind of find uh, this tree is pretty messy and I couldn't uh, depict what, what can be inferred from this. So I kind of used um, uh, my optimal parameter and I got 0 0.016 as the CP. So that's why based on that value, I created another plot and uh, here I can see the outcomes are pretty visible and uh, whichever uh, the values, uh, glucose values are less than 154. Uh, from there itself, the split has started. So which is the correct one, I 
I think this might be the correct approach to decide, uh, you know, pruning a decision tree. And then uh, this is the last, uh, like, uh, based on all the models, I think logistic regression worked better than even neural network, which is quite surprising, but yeah, I would like to explore more. That's it. Questions for Swain Shu. I have one to, to start off with. What is, what is the correlation in your data? It was, wasn't totally clear to me. Is there a correlation element? Are there, are there elements that are correlated with each other in your models or? Yes, the features are correlated. For example, uh, glucose with respect to insulin. Basically all the attributes, I can see three or four pairs. Th those are highly correlated. Okay, how do, you, how do you address that in your model? How do you address the correlation in your model or the, any of the models? I kept the correlation because, uh, I mean, it can be, I thought it might be useful for uh, the, any kind of model, but uh, I, I didn't do anything about the mul uh, multi-correlarity, <laughs> frankly. I, I just did the missing value analysis and the correlation factor, yeah, I just kept it. I just analyzed and I kept it. I mean, Matt, the, the correlations are, will be accounted for in the decision tree because the decision tree uses either the Gini impurity or the entropy calculation based on information gain so through information theory. And so it'll construct the, the tree accounting for the correlations in her data set. Where is yeah. that? Maybe that's Sorry. why when I plotted first uh, this tree, it was like this. But when I choose uh, the optimal parameter, uh, uh, that is 0 0.016. After that, I can see this, there is a change in it. Okay. Where is that quantified in your model? You know, like typically in our regression models, our longitudinal models, we, we have correlation parameters, you know, that you can quantify. Is that, is there anything quantified in yeah, this? So the method? values on her decision tree, those are either Gini impurities or entropy calculations. And those, those are calculated based on information gain through the data set based on entropy. Right. How does so that, that relate to like correlation. correlation parameter? No, there isn't a correlation parameter. It's, it's, it's accounted for using information theory. And so it'll maximize based on information gain. So how much information each data set gives you, accounting for all the other data set, the data values in your data set. It's still not clear to me, still not clear to me how, you know, how we have correlated units. Um, you know, at least in the sense that we normally talk about it, it, it could be, but I'll, I have to look at this a little more thoroughly. Um, but thanks, Jonathan, for that. Any other questions uh, for Swain Shu? So for the neural network, did you try to tune the parameters? Like the uh, number of hidden layers, the hidden nodes? Yeah, I tried with one hidden layer and then, uh, but it was not giving that accuracy. So I considered accuracy as my primary factor to choose a model. So when I added three uh, hidden layers, uh, the results were pretty low. It was like only 60%. So I thought maybe two layers will be better. And maybe it, uh, it kind of, uh, because of the splitting, it should be 80-20. So that I need to check again. And what is your final transformation on your neural network? Is it a ReLU, a reticular linear unit? So your, your sigmoid function? Uh, sigmoid is logistic uh, function I have used. Okay. Let's uh, let's go ahead and move on uh, since we're we are we're running a little bit behind here. So um, Jonathan, do you want to go ahead and start? Um, Swain, shoot, yeah. yeah. Back and I will see you next week, okay? I think you're on mute. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan, yep. Sorry. That's Sorry okay. that happens all the time. All right, so, I do it too, so a little bit of background, which I think everyone here knows that climate change is a global concern because of the more frequent wildfires, the rising sea levels, the longer periods of drought, and the more intense storms. 
So I want to talk about the data because my data is actually three data sets that I had to uh, clean up and kind of merge together. So I had a data set that contained average temperatures. And so this was an 8.6 million observation data set. And so in this data set, it had average temperatures on a monthly basis by country, city, year. And then I had uh, the longitude and latitude coordinates and degrees, so the Euclidean distances. And then I grabbed the carbon dioxide emissions data set, which was the carbon dioxide emissions uh, in metric tons per year by city. And then finally, I grabbed the data set that was atmospheric carbon dioxide data. And this was the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere measured in parts per million uh, on a yearly basis based on country. And so after uh, uh, cleaning up the data set, and so I had to cut, so it was 8.6 million. So I had to cut the years between 1970 and 2012. And then I, I merged the second data set, so the carbon dioxide emissions data set um, based on the keys of year and, uh, and city of the first data set, and then the final data set was merged based on year and country. And so at the end, I had a, a data set that consisted of year, city, country, carbon dioxide emissions in metric tons, atmospheric carbon dioxide in, measured in parts per million. I had latitude that I converted into radians to account for the, uh, uh, the global shape of the, of the earth. And then longitude, I also converted to radians. And so I had 137,000 observations with three, a little bit more than 3,000 cities and 43 years of repeated measures. So my modeling strategy is I used a Bayesian framework. And so specifically, I used an integrated nested Laplace approximation. And so this is a deterministic Bayesian approach. So this is different than what we normally use, which is a, probabil a probabilistic Bayesian approach. So MCMC is probabilistic. Every time you fit the model, even if you're using the same data set, if you don't set a seed or a random state in other programming languages, then you get varying results between fits. But this is a deterministic Bayesian approach. So as long as you use the same data set, you will always get the same estimates. And so the way that this works is that in the probabilistic Bayesian approaches, you draw from your posterior, which is a joint posterior. So it's a joint probability. And the deterministic Bayesian approach is a univariate marginal posterior that you're drawing from. And so my, the, the way that I decided to model this uh, data set is I used the average yearly temperature as my outcome. And then my predictor was atmospheric carbon dioxide. And I, I fit five models in increasing uh, complexity. So I just did an intercept mo only model. And then I added the predictor and then I added random intercept for city. And then I added a spatial random, spatial random effects. And then finally I added a uh, temporal random effects. And so the, the reason why I chose atmospheric carbon dioxide as my predictor is that when I was fitting models with carbon dioxide emissions, uh, I was getting a negative relationship between average temperatures and carbon dioxide. And so I kind of looked at the data a little bit more, more closely and I saw that at, at a certain time um, across the 1970 to 2012 years, a lot of the countries were um, producing less emissions, but temperature was still rising. And that's because the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was still increasing. So what I did was I plotted the relationship between the atm atmospheric carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide emissions. And I could see that it was a, a linear increasing relationship. So as carbon dioxide emissions kept increasing, even though some countries or some cities were producing less carbon dioxide emissions, the total atmospheric carbon dioxide was still increasing. And so that's why I decided to model atmospheric carbon dioxide as my predictor. And here I, I put snapshots of three years that are 20 years apart. And you can see the, so the sizes of the circles are how much carbon dioxide emission is being produced by the countries. And so you can kind of see like a huge explosion on this side of the map. All right, so now let me talk about um, how to model the spatial random effects. So I, had to, I have to discretize space. So I have to tell the model what cities and what countries are closer together and what cities and countries are further apart. So I had to construct a two-dimensional triangular mesh. And then I had to construct a projection matrix for my data set. And I had to project down into this mesh. And so the way that this works is that uh, any, any data point that falls on a, a node, so any corner of a triangle, it's related to the uh, nodes that are connected to it. And if it falls within a, a, a triangle in the mesh, 
then its weight gets distributed between the three corners of the triangle that it fell inside, and then those get connected. Uh, uh, so th those would be more related to the corners of the adjacent tri triangles. And so how does the model um, use this triangle mesh? mesh? It, well, it's a, it's a matern covariance structure with stochastic partial differential equations. And so that's an object that it uses. And since this is a Bayesian approach, I used a penalized complexity prior, which just means that the more complex this triangular mesh becomes, the more penalized my model is because of it. And so you can see that there are two layers of this mesh. And the reason for this is that we construct an outer layer that has lower triangular density so that we can avoid what is called edge effect, which biases your estimates. And then the way that these uh, polygons work is that these are in the units of your measurement. So my location measurements are in radians. So each you can set the length of these um, edges as you desire based on the radians. So you have to work. So you have to kind of play around to get a, a good mesh. And so here are the results of the model fits. And I use the deviance information criteria, which is the analog of an AIC in Bayesian statistics. And you can see that um, when we add the random intercepts, so when we start introducing random effects, there's a huge uh, decrease in the deviance information criteria. And then there's a, a, a substantial decrease when you introduce the spatial random effects. So those are based on geographical location. And then when I introduce the temporal random effects, which is an AR, AR1 process on the year, so our repeated measures are years, there's really a, a slight uh, benefit to that. And then this is a sp spatial field plot from my fifth model. And you can see that uh, temperatures are more correlated around the equator. And then uh, they get um, the temperatures decrease in, in, in centigrade as you move away from the equator. And here are the fixed effects and the random effects of my fifth model. And so the atmospheric carbon dioxide here says that with every one part per million increase, which is our unit of measurement for atmospheric carbon dioxide, there is a 0.001 degree Celsius increase in average temperatures. And this is the 95% uh, highest posterior density credible interval, so the analog of confidence intervals in Bayesian statistics. And then interestingly, the, um, so the AR1 uh, covariate estimates, which are posterior means, so there's a low correlation, and it's not really significant, but I'm not really sure how to interpret not really significant. We didn't really talk about that too much in this class. So I decided to keep this model as my final model. And then finally, some limitations. So I use a two-dimensional mesh, but I could have used a three-dimensional mesh. And I could have used, uh, ideally, you would have something like elevation as your z-axis. But you could still have uh, set your z-axis to ones. And then what would happen is, in this mesh, there's so it's saying that this point over, can you guys see my mouse in, in the presentation? Okay. So this is saying that this point here is less correlated than this point here for this point over here. But in reality, the, the earth kind of is, is, a, is a sphere. So this point should be more correlated when, than what this mesh is saying. And so you can build a three-dimensional mesh and that will take into, that into account. And then I want to talk about the spatial temporal model. So the fifth model, I used a separable spatial temporal model. What that means is that the spatial random effects and the temporal random effects are, are placed on the model, but separately. You can use an inseparable uh, spatial temporal model where for every um, group or cluster, or in my case, it would be year, you would project the, the specific year's data point into several different meshes for how many ever, how many different types of or how many number of years you have, and then you fit the model, which is an inseparable spatial temporal model. But I had 43 repeated measures, so that computationally was, uh, it took a long time and a lot of times it crashed. But I was able to do it with like 13 years. And so I think um, with data sets that have less groups, you could probably do that. And then finally, the final uh, limitation is that uh, a one predictor model is probably naive. And if you show this to a meteorologist, then they will tell you there are a million different things that you should probably adjust for. And you should have more than one covariate. And so this is why um, this would be a limitation. So I'm sure there are other things that I should include in this model. And that's all I have. Uh, Jonathan, um, so do you have like model fit? Do you have like, um, 
you know, what, what is the result in terms of, uh, you know, the trend over time or the relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature? Do you have, do you have any information on that to present? No, I didn't have any, any information like that. So what do you take away from this? I mean, it looks pretty interesting and, and complicated, but like what, what would you tell people based on the model that you fit here? Well, I, I would interpret these results over here where a one unit increase, yeah, which is okay. one part per million increase would increase our average yearly temperature by 0 0.001 degrees centigrade. Right, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, maybe I went too fast on this slide. <laughs> maybe I missed, I don't know. But yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm talking about. So so by um, by changing the the carbon dioxide, that that was a, the key to really understanding that that relationship. Then right, yeah, right. because even though countries started producing less emissions of carbon dioxide, they were still getting trapped in the yeah. atmosphere. Well, and that's that's important. You know, that's an, that's important to understand that um, you know that we're we're starting to tur turn things around right i mean yeah cities are starting to to make less yeah, I, but, I but we still data. have yeah i only had data for 2012 but i think it would have been it would have been interesting to have data at 2015 which is when they signed the paris treaty so i would I it would have been interesting to see how that affected things but i didn't have data to that at that time point right well, that's a that's a complicated model. It's that's pretty pretty interesting. Um, it sounds like Bayesian is is uh, is pretty hot today, right? Yeah. The Bayesian techniques. Um, so that's good. And um, a really quick question. Yeah, go go yeah, ahead. So uh, based on your result, I'm thinking whether you could include some time series things into that because, as you said. Um, the emission of the carbon dioxide might not immediately affect your temperature, right? Is it um, useful if we include some time lag where like a like a higher, just like dimensional of arima where- Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you could get some insight from using time lags and, and using like uh, time series approaches to this data set. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you. Well, and your slide, you do have, uh, you, you, you use uh, AR1. Yeah, I use an AR, so yeah, I use an AR1 process on the year, which is, which is a, a, a time series process, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan, I was wondering, it would be, I think it'd be interesting if you also just wrote this term in terms of like a standard deviation increase, because as someone who doesn't know anything about like carbon dioxide, I don't really know like how big that is. Right. Yeah, I can. I can probably do that. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. Any other quick questions? All right. Nice job, um, Wei Shuang. Want to take it away? So can can everyone see my screen? Okay. So um, the project I am working on is actually called the COVID-19 monthly deaths by country. And this is actually the data set I retrieved from the um, One World data set, One World data website. And um, in this project, I use, uh, I use a different kind of modeling scheme in the longitudinal data analysis. So, here is a brief introduction to some of the um, selected variables, which I think should be very typical in this data set because um, in this whole data set, there are like 54 covariates with 100 or more countries. And some of the typical data set we see here are the continent, the monthly death, like the monthly cases, and the healthcare index, such as the life expectancy, like cardiovascular death rates, stuff like that. And you have the total population as well. And also the hospital bed per thousand, those are the health index as well. And we, we do also have the economic index by country included in this data set, which is like the GDP per capita. And I remember there is a human development index as well, but 
it is not shown here. So here is a very simple um, spaghetti plot of the monthly death by month for each country. And for most of those lines, we can kind of see that um, this trend is, the trend of the monthly death is actually decreasing, which means probably um, after like the virus is mutated, like it is less hazard than it was before. And we, we can also see that there are a few countries with like a very high number of monthly deaths. And this trend is very consistent. But for most of the country, the monthly death is actually very low. This is ju just probably because they don't have that many of cases. Um, so the, the second set of um, exploratory data analysis is, is to use the canonical correlation analysis to explore the data. So canonical correlation analysis is that um, we basically split the data into the covariance data and outcome data. And the outcome data is just the monthly death from April to October. And we are trying to find the best linear combination such that these two data set are max, um, the correlation between these two data set are maximized. Um, here is the result of the canonical correlation analysis. And the graph in the left, um, the x axis is dimension one is the, is the best canonical correlation solutions, which is the linear combination. And the, and the dimensional two, dimension two is actually the second best um, canonical correlation. Um, so based on this graph, we can kind of see that if um, the value of either the y-axis or x-axis is very high, that means this variable is having a high contribution to this overall canonical correlation. And from this graph, we can kind of see that um, the variables such as latitude, like age 70 and older, this is the proportional of um, people age 70 or older, and there's a median age, there's a cardiovascular rate, and longitude, they're, they're actually having the higher impact on the outcome variable of monthly deaths. And the graph in the right is kind of like using the canonical correlation solutions to project the data into the two-dimensional space. This is one way to find like whether some of the countries are the outliers or the influential points. And from this graph, we can, we can see that um, the United States is right here and, the, and the Canada and United Kingdom, they're right there. So these three um, countries are actually um, the influential points of our analysis. So I'll be briefly introducing the um, modeling strategy I'll be using. Um, this is actually the model published in 2019, which incorporate the random forest algorithm into the traditional linear mix model. Um, so before entering into the random forest, I um, just kind of want to introduce the decision tree. So the decision tree is actually um, an algorithm that kind of partition the data into subset by binary split, split based on the variables. And in the next slide, I will be showing a very simple example of the decision tree. And the random forest is actually um, a ensemble method based upon the decision tree, which aggregates many decision trees, for example, like 500 decision trees to improve, to further improve the prediction accuracy on the decision tree. So here is a very simple example of decision tree on the car mileage prediction. So on the top of that, you kind of want to make a decision to see um, whether the car weight is very heavy. If it is yes, then it will have a high mileage. If it's no, then we kind of want to judge like if the horsepower is smaller, smaller or equal to 86. If, if yes, then it has a high mileage. And if no, it has a low mileage. So um, the decision tree in the longitudinal data analysis framework is um, the model that is presented here. So the yij is the outcome variable, which is the monthly death in our example of individual i, the country i, at time j. 
And this F function is actually the car tree, which is the binary split decision tree um, we, we've shown before. And this term is actually very familiar for us because this is just the random effect term for the linear mix model. And the novelty is the novelty comes into this paper is that they use a omega i t j, which is which is the Gaussian process to account for the serial correlation. So they're not using things like um, compound symmetry, AR1 or unstructured, but instead they're using the stochastic process. And um, this, this is um, showing a great prediction performance when um, the number of time point is sufficiently large. And so the previous model is about the decision tree in longitudinal data analysis. But now we have to extend that to the random forest. So here is actually the step-by-step -step, um, procedure you have to take to extend the decision tree to the random forest. So in the first two steps, you, you just kind of want to select a random sample of data and the covariates. And based on this random sample, you're going to um, build a decision tree, um, build a decision tree to fit the model and predict the monthly depth for sample that are not selected in this bootstrap sample they are using to train the decision tree. Um, as we mentioned before, um, you have to use, so for random forest, you have to use like many trees, like desirably it should be um, 500 to 1,000. So, um, so we're gonna like grow multiple trees to repeat by repeating these four steps like multiple times. And after we have multiple trees, we have, we, we, we have multiple prediction results for each sample observation. And what we're going to do is actually to average all of those prediction results to get the final prediction result, which is called average out-of-back prediction. And when we have the out-of-back prediction, um, we can actually calculate the prediction error. You use the out-of-back MSE. So the modeling step for our example is that in the step one, we use the fixed effect model, which is the regular random forest model. Um, we consider all the variables and, and, and perform the variable selection use this R package, which specifically is specifically designed for the random forest. And after the variable selection, here is a set of um, variables we've selected for this um, um, that potentially have the um, high impact on the outcome of monthly death. For example, population, proportion of um, people aged 65 or 70 older, and latitude, and stuff like that. And after we have this set of covariates, um, we lock, um, know that we, we, we in, in our modeling step, we actually um, lock transform all of the monthly deaths, monthly cases, and population, just because those data are actually highly wide skewed. And in the last step, we actually use the longitudinal random forest uh, with random intercept and, and random slow of month with a serial correlation of um, Brownian motion defined here to um, finally fit the model. And in the model result, we grow 500 trees. Um, like each tree, we have seven randomly selected variable. Um, and the final out of back MSE is um, 0 0.2, which is pretty good because uh, we kind of see that the average R square for these um, 500 trees is actually 70, uh, 97%. And also, the random intercept variance is um, 0 0.8, but for the random slope is actually very low and the covariance between the random intercept and random slope is very low as well, which probably indicate um, in the future we, we can drop the random slope for the months. And also we have the parameter associated with the Brownian motion to be 0 0.72, which is the volatility for the Brownian motion. And it should be very similar to the the AR1 process, when you have the high value, is just like the serial correlation is very high. So here is um, 
the variable importance based on two different metrics. So um, in the, the first metric is the increase in MSE, which means if you randomly permute this variable, then what will be the amount of increase in the MSE of your model? So, and the, and the selection criteria, the importance criteria here for the node purity is actually um, the change in RS, RSS before and after the split. So these two results are actually pretty consistent and it is showing that the population and, and proportional, proportional older people um, are actually highly impacting the um, outcome of monthly death, which is kind of intuitive because the, the, more, the more people you have in this country and it is likely that there will be more deaths. And um, the latitude is kind of counterintuitive and since, since we don't really know like the directionality of the effect, so we cannot really interpret the result right here. But um, what we can do is actually to select this top six variable and fit another decision tree and to visualize the result to see how, uh, uh, to see the pattern of that impact. But um, since this is only one single decision tree, it is not guaranteed that this is actually um, representing a true um, relationship or true decision process of that result of random forest. But as you can kind of see that um, when the population is smaller than a certain number, then um, the average monthly death should be smaller. But if it's not, then the average monthly death should be higher. And when it is for further smaller, then you will have like a further smaller average monthly death. And among those further smaller population countries, if some of those countries have like the proportional of age 70 or older to be smaller, then this is, um, this is guaranteed to have like a smaller um, average monthly death. So this um, decision process is kind of intuitive, but along this line, it is kind of counterintuitive because it is like when you have the population is greater than and the average death is, um, is lower, but, um, but if the population is like smaller, then you will probably have like a higher monthly death. So this is why I say um, this is not guaranteed to be a very um, accurate result, a accurate representation of the actual random forest. And here is the paper um, I used to fit, the mod to fit the model. And that's all for my presentation. Nice job. That's very interesting. Any quick questions for Wishwan? Uh, yes, in fact, I have a question about uh, will your method solve the confounding problem directly? Or is it get through the pruning, pruning process? Because we can see there is a lot of confounders where like uh, causal relations in some of your variables, right? Um, I think, I think for the random forest, um, they actually, um, they actually have a very, very nice result of that, of accounting for the interaction between the variables, but for the accounting, about accounting for the confounding effect, um, I'm not sure if, um, the random forest is accounting for the confounding effect, but, um, f but for random forest, I guess the, most important goal is to make a prediction instead of making inferences. So that's why um, I think they don't really um, consider the confounding effect, but I can, like after class, I can search online to see if they have some nice result. Yeah, and the other one is because we can see the population uh, get into your tree multiple times. Um, do you think it's better to use like a recursive, like a 
um, binary splitting where like a decision tree to include certain variables multiple times? Um, so this one is actually, um, this one is actually done by the re recursive partitioning. And this is just like what I'm saying, like one decision tree is actually very, very unstable. And I actually play around this and I, I, I do observe that when I set, set up like different parameters, even I include the same set of variables, um, the decision tree is way different. And what does that mean? Um, so that means the, the, the tree structure would highly dependent on which variable you fit first. Um, yes. So I guess um, for the for the optimization for the decision tree, um, I, I don't quite remember what 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 they're doing, but based it is more like based on the parameter you are setting up, um, you have that kind of order from the top to the bottom. But this is like highly sensitive to the parameter you set, and that's why we have to build like multiple decision trees and. If you include a different set of variables, I, I, do, I do play around that and it is like a very different decision tree and it is, the decision tree is even counterintuitive. So um, in general, this is not a good way to interpret the result, but for the visualization purpose, I did this. But I have uh, one suggestion. I mean, uh, while building the random tree, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, how many features you have used as in I just missed that part as in there will be some M try or N trees, right? So Yeah, so um in, uh, Variables, okay Um. So here I use ran, uh, seven randomly selected variables, but for in the paper they suggest that I have to use at least half of the variables or even two-thirds of the variables to in order to like produce a pretty consistent result because if I use like only seven randomly selected variables, it just probably means for some of the trees, I actually select the variables that are less impacting the outcome variable. Okay. I may have missed this, but do you have a variable on like large scale public interventions that happens like shutdowns or um, those are the variable I try to include, but I don't know where they provide this kind of data. So, yeah, I don't I just, have that. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, looking at the spaghetti plot, mm -hmm. I would think those differences really come from public health interventions yeah. across countries. Yeah, and I guess one of the solution for that is to, to kind of analyze the news using, like, some of the... In, NLP techniques, for example, you, you can use the sentiment analysis to see kind of like whether the government is positive or negative on the country shutdown or things like that. We're going to run over a little bit. So, um, you know, if you need to go, you can go. But uh, I, I, I want to ask one question. I actually have three or four, but I'm just <laughs> I'll ask one. So like, you know, in a typical regression model, if you put in latitude or longitude, you, you would think of, you know, just a linear term, right, for, for latitude or longitude. But I'm, I'm wondering in your model, what, how is like, if you put in latitude or longitude, is it, how is it dealt with? Is it dealt with in a parametric framework or, or can you explain, you know, how, how um, that how that would be modeled like if you put in latitude as a predictor um is it treated like a linear term or is it just like looking at any differences that could be occurring across latitudes or or how, how does it work exactly um so in this in this example i just treat it as the very simple linear term to incorporate in the model but um i'll try to find a line to see if 
there is a method that can incorporate the the spatial relationship in the in the in yeah. the random forest. I'm just thinking, like, because you you'd expect differences as you go from like you know Canada to USA to Mexico to Central America and then down through the equator, and then but then maybe it would the trend would would go back, you know, as you go into South America, like there could be differences around the equator compared to like North America and South America, you know, further south, that there may, it may not be linear, maybe quadratic or, or, or even something different, you know, but I, I can see why latitude might pop out as, as an important predictor, whereas longitude, maybe not, you know, just or, intuitively. But, yeah, or I can add a variable that consider the longitude, latitude, and the continent information simultaneously. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, that's interesting. Um, thanks for that. We have one more speaker, Sumac, and um, I know uh, I would say like if there's any questions that come up that that you guys want to ask, you know, if we're running out of time, also feel free to put them on chat or, or email or whatever. I want to be able to have people ask questions and stuff. And I, I've had more than, than I can, I want to ask um, just to, you know, to stay on time. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and have uh, Sumac give his presentation. And I'll go ahead and quickly share my screen. Yeah. All right, we got it. Yep. Uh, so my project mainly deals with uh, Medicaid and its impact on adult mortality rates. Uh, so the primary research question that I'm interested in answering through this is uh, the is the Affordable Care Act's Medicaid expansion is associated with uh, adult mortality rates, and the primary hypothesis that I want to uh, that I'm thinking it should be like. Uh, all cause adult mortality rate should decrease in counties that belongs to state uh, that expanded Medicaid uh, from that to counties that did not belong to the states which expanded it, right? So just to give a brief background or a context, uh, so Medicare is a federal state uh, partnership program and we know it provides health insurance coverage to people with uh, low income and to people with qualifying uh, disabilities. So the Affordable Care Act uh, launched a whole nationwide Medicaid expansion program uh, on January 1st, uh, 2014 and Medicaid was uh, expanded for uh, every childless adults belonging to the age group of uh, 90 to 64 years uh, to 138 percent of the federal poverty line. And however, while the implementation was supposed to be nationwide, uh, this decision was challenged and not every state actually adopted this expansion. So uh, on January 1st, uh, 2014, only 24 states and District of Columbia adopted and implemented this expansion. However, uh, as of current date, uh, 36 states have actually gone ahead and adopted this. So just to give a uh, more detailed picture, uh, this is a graph obtained from Kaiser Family Foundation where they have kind of uh, shown which states uh, have adopted and which states uh, didn't adopt. So as you can see, uh, the states in uh, blue are the ones uh, who have adopted this expansion, uh, whereas uh, the states in the orange are the ones who didn't adopt, and there are two states like uh, Missouri and Oklahoma, where while they have uh, in, like uh, adopted the expansion, they haven't implemented it yet. So that kind of brings us uh, to my study. So my primary data is obtained from uh, the compressed mortality files of the CDC. So basically, uh, from the uh, CMF, uh, CTC, I can get data on mortality and population count for uh, the counties, as well as I can get data from some of the demographic variables, and as uh, data for information on uh, state's decision about where which states actually uh, went forward with the expansion. I have obtained that from uh, Kaiser Family Foundation and uh, some of the uh, county level uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, overlay uh, data I have obtained from uh, the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics and from the census. And basically, I have uh, merged all these data sets to make a single data set. Uh, and because all like my primary uh, unit of observation is a county level, I can merge them on based on the county FIPS code. And for the state's decision on uh, 
expanding medical or not, those I can merge them on with, with the help of uh, state fifth code. So finally, my final data set is like uh, restricted to uh, age groups of 25 to 64. And this is mainly because uh, if, if in some counties uh, for certain age groups, uh, if there are very less data, CDC actually does not report them. So the most consistent uh, like age groups well, like the four age groups between the age ranges of 25 to 64 that CDC reported, and it made sense to just uh, look at this uh, the, this range of age group for my uh, project. So, the data structure, my data structure, even the and like I said, it's at the county level. However, I have data uh, on counties for all the 50 states, and it uh, goes from the years 2011 to 2016, and my Outcome measure is uh, the all cause adult mortality rate, and it is defined as the number of dates, uh, deaths belonging to age groups of 25 to 64 year old, and they are expressed uh, per 100,000 population. So, since we know that uh, at different points of time, many states have actually gone ahead and uh, adopted the Medicaid expansion even after the 1st of Jan 2014. For the sake of simplicity, I only consider the states which uh, adopted the expansion on time. Uh, to be the, uh, the states which belong to the treatment group and the other 26 states to be the ones who belong to the control group. Uh, so, and some of the covariates I'm controlling for are like the uh, average county level poverty and unemployment rate and the average median household incomes within the county as, a, as well as uh, I have some demographic factors like the proportion of uh, male and female population in a, country, in a county, proportion of uh, non-Hispanic, white, non-Hispanic, black and other races within a county. So, and lastly, we have the, I created a post variable, which is like equal to one if the year is greater than 2014 and is zero otherwise. So, these are some of the summary statistics stratified by uh, treatment of Medicare expansion. So, as you can see, the adult of moderate rate in states that uh, expanded Medicare is, uh, the average is actually lower uh, compared to the uh, states where it didn't expand and uh, uh, like they differ in certain aspects, but for most of the like social economy factors, they are mostly similar. So we can, I mean, it's, it's safe to say that they are mostly comparable. And so my outcome of final moderate rate kind of uh, looks like this without uh, log transformation. It's uh, not exactly normally distributed, but uh, when I log transform the outcome, it, it's more or less normally distributed with a little bit of a uh, very slight left skew, which is very close to zero. So it can be ignored. Uh, so here I'm looking at the change differences in uh, adult mortality rate over time. And as you can see here, actually we are seeing an increasing trend, but this is like the overall differences and this is not which we actually want to see. So when I look at the average mortality rate stratified by treatment, I'm actually seeing like I saw in the summary statistic that the uh, mean of that is actually decreasing in the states which expanded when it compared to the uh, So for the statistical approach, uh, I'm mainly using a difference in difference approach. So this is basically an approach mainly used by uh, researchers from my field as well as from uh, by health policy researchers and uh, health services researchers. Basically, what this does is it compares uh, differences in outcomes between treatment and the control group, uh, and based on uh, based on a comparison between uh, post and the pre period, and Secondly, I'm using a time as categorical approach and a time as continuous for the model fits. Uh, I'm mainly using a linear based model with a random intersect for each subject, which in my case is the state, along with an uh, unstructured variance covariance structure. And uh, I have like done four types of uh, linear based model fits. Uh, and lastly, uh, I've also uh, fitted up Poison uh, generalized estimable uh, version with a uh, repeat a statement for each uh, subject, again, which is the state in my case, uh, and with a composite variance covariance structure. And lastly, I fitted a uh, generalized linear mixed model quadrature uh, with a random intercept for each subject, again, with an unstructured uh, variance covariance structure. So for the Poison G fit and the G0 LM, LMM fit, I have, uh, not, uh, my outcome is the non log version, whereas for the LMM, I've used the log version of my outcome. So for the fixed effects part of the model, basically I have like two approaches, mainly that time with one where I'm using the year and the other where I'm using the period. So the one which I, where I'm using the period is basically the same, just for the year part, I'm just, instead of the year, I have like the post variable in the model 
and the introduction between the Medicare and post. And Medicare is one if states that expanded Medicare on January uh, 1st, 2014 and is equal to zero otherwise. And post is one if the year is uh, 2014 or uh, beyond and is uh, zero if it's before 2014. And the uh, XCST refers to a factor of uh, covariance, which are at the county level. So some of the, uh, like the results from the mean results from my model uh, are uh, like, these and for each of the models, I've run both the unadjusted version and the adjusted version with covariates. So as you can see, uh, in my first uh, uh, simple difference and difference uh, linear mix model fit, um, why in the unadjusted version I'm getting a negative coefficient uh, for my uh, primary variable of interest. I'm, when I adjust for covariates, I'm not uh, no longer getting a, a negative coefficient, which was which was a desired sign I would have uh, liked to have. And uh, as you can see, uh, it is not, uh, the results are not significant. Again, similarly, when I doing time, for time as categorical, I'm only uh, showing the results for the year 2016. And here the reference category is uh, the year 2013, which is the year just before the Medicare expansion actually took place. So again, uh, less like the previous model fit, uh, here also my results are insignificant. Similarly, if you uh, if I uh, fit again, uh, time is continuous. Uh, again, same thing. I do not find any significant uh, results. And for when I'm fitting uh, uh, Poisson uh, GE, again, uh, my results are uh, not significant. So, in all of the models, this is like the same trend. Like, except in the last uh, model where I do uh, fit a generalized uh, linear mix model. Uh, for digital, I'm actually finding a negative coefficient, which is the desired sign I would have assumed. However, still the results are insignificant. So, some of the limitations I would say that firstly, the main limitation, as we can see from my results, like what I hypothesized was, was that uh, counties belonging to states that expanded Medicare should see a reduction in the adult mortality rates, uh, where uh, compared to the counties which belong belong to a states which did not expand, but actually I did not see that. And these these results uh, were remain the same across uh, multiple model fits. So uh, I would say that uh, one limitation is the time period because I have only three uh, three years of post period data because uh, that's till the year till which CDC has released data till now. So it would be interesting to see if I have uh, more years of data because the, my health outcome is like a population level health outcome. And, Sometimes it takes uh, some time to actually these things to get affected. And, uh, and one other limitation would be, uh, since I am assuming uh, that all states which expanded Medicare on the 1st of January uh, 2014, the year 2014 as the Medicare expand, as the states belonging to the treatment group, it could be that states which expanded later is maybe driving the results. And lastly, one, uh, I could use a different approach, which is like, again, uh, some a similar approach used by uh, researchers in my field, uh, which is a uh, difference in difference in difference, which is basically the same uh, difference in difference approach, but uh, here we are static, we could stratify it by a, a third factor. And one such third factor could be uh, uninsured rates, pre period uninsured rates. So basically, uh, counties which uh, with uh, lower uninsured rates prior to the Medicare expansion should uh, see a higher uh, result in uh, or higher decrease uh, in uh, adult mortality rates compared to the countries, uh, counties which uh, had uh, higher, uh, lower uninsured rates in the pre period. And, yeah, and that kind of like sums it up. Yeah. Uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah. So you had a um, your unit is the county, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, did you did you count for spatial correlation at all, or? Uh, no, 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 no. I didn't. Yeah. Randy, did you have a question you're gonna ask? Uh, I just want to ask, uh, what software are uh, you use? Sorry. Oh, uh, so I mainly used uh, SAS for my analysis part and. Uh, for the data cleaning and data management, I use data. 
Stay there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But all the analysis I did in SAS because it's kind of easier to fit the mixed models in SAS than I feel than in okay. data. Yeah. Nice work, everybody. That 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 was uh, um, interesting today. A lot of methods like going beyond what we've talked about in class. Um, so that was interesting to. to